Aloha. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. Time for our new show, American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Trump's Influence in the 2022 and 2024 Election. Uh, I'd like to go right to our guests. I'd like to introduce Jay Fidel and Chuck Crumpton, a Hawaii mediator and arbitrator. Uh, good morning to you both. Good morning, Tim. You morning, Tim. mentioned that Chuck, Chuck hosts not one, but two other shows here on ThinkTech. So he's a visiting host with real credentials. <laughs> Close to being a ThinkTech Hawaii junkie. <laughs> <laughs> like us all. All right. Well, hey, thanks for coming on uh, this morning. And uh, let's talk about Donald Trump. I mean, you know, after the election, you know, 2022, there was predictions on this very show, although it had a different title, that uh, Trump influence would diminish, that he would be forgotten, kind of like when Richard Nixon went away. But uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. And Jay, to you on this first question, you know, we have these books, these tell-all books from um, Mark Esper, his recent one, who was the Secretary of Defense, uh, John Bolton, and William Barr, these, these, these books that tell these incredible tales of outlandish behavior and comments uh, from Trump that weren't jokes. They were, they were not said in jest. They were serious um, commands, if you will, from the commander in chief. And uh, they basically had to go behind the scenes and try to placate him or try to uh, change the subject so he would get off these crazy topics. For example, in Mark Esper's book, he talks about uh, the immediate withdrawal from South Korea, or worse yet, um, all family personnel from military to leave South Korea, indicating in North Korea there might be a strike in the fourth, you know, in the near future, uh, or his 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 um, comments about bombing Mexico, sending missiles into Mexico to hit the drug labs. I mean, these are crazy, crazy statements, but they couldn't just pass them off. They had to seriously consider them. So here's the question. After these, these books that have come out and would indicate to the, the public that something's not right with Donald Trump, yet Donald Trump enjoys a healthy uh, favorability rate and to everyone's um, knowledge that he is the top contender for the 2024 presidential nominee for the GOP. What are we to say about that? <laughs> Only some people read those books, actually, Tim. <laughs> well, they're not just in the books. They actually hit the both the news on on Fox, Fox Entertainment, and MSNBC and CNN. Mm, it's true. It's got to be getting out into the the base to some extent, and and uh, they have a mechanism in dealing with it. I mean, they they don't believe anything negative about Trump, or if they believe it, they don't think it's important. It's irrelevant to them, and they maintain their baseness. I use that term with multiple meanings. Um, but, you know, bottom line is, is, it occurs to me, just watching what's going on here, is that there's really two Trumps. One is the public face, which is, you know, flawed and ridiculous. But then there's the, the Trump that works behind the scenes. The Trump, the Trump that spends, you know, 24 by 7 working on enhancing his, his base, his relationship with people. It doesn't come automatic. It doesn't become... It doesn't. It just hap It doesn't happen just because of a, uh, a couple of remarks he makes at a at a, an event. It happens because he's working all the time, and he's got a staff of people that are working all the time in order to enhance his relationships with the base. Um, and that's one reason why you know not only is he not diminishing, but he's growing. And um, <clears throat> I I think it's important to mention that the likelihood is that Elon Musk will buy Twitter. And the certainty is that if he does buy Twitter, he's going to let Trump back on again for reasons that are hard to follow. But, you know, Elon Musk has given us his rationale for that. And uh, if Trump gets back on Twitter and he said that he doesn't want to do it, he's got some other alternative, you know, uh, Twitter type organization. Uh, but I don't think he's going to ride, ride that one home. He's going to get back on Twitter. And if he does, and he will be using that more than he did before. 
Uh, and the other point I'd like to make before you, you go on here is that Trump, however ridiculous he is, and, and I could use lots of other adjectives, um, he learns. And he learned through his four years. He has learned since his four years. He has learned how to organize, for example, an insurrection. He has learned how to hire people that are completely unqualified. He has learned how to manipulate the Congress and the courts. He has learned how to do things that are completely destructive to the democracy and the country. And he, you know, it's a nightmare scenario, but if he gets elected in 2024, it's going to be, he's going to be more effective, believe it or not, and he is going to be much worse, and the democracy is going to be at much greater risk because he learns. Those are the defining things about him now. Let's go to the point about um, Donald Trump's potential um, reemergence on Twitter. Uh, you know, Mitch McConnell and the GOP um, probably could squarely assign blame to Donald Trump that the Senate races in, in Georgia were as a direct result of his comments before the run-up of the election. Is this going to serve the GOP well if Donald Trump gets back on Twitter and starts sending landmines or planting landmines all over the uh, social media as he did before he was kicked off? I mean, it didn't help him in many ways uh, that he was on Twitter. And so is the GOP and specifically Mitchell McConnell, are they hesitant to see that happen? You know, when they were criticizing him over that and blaming you know him for various things and including in so many words the insurrection i, I have one re one remark i want to make it's a short sentence that was then <laughs> okay and, and the gop guys you know seem to have a sort of this sort of uh, general amnesia uh where they say one thing and then next time you look they're saying 180 opposite and they get away with it and I think one of the reasons is that the whatever bonds them together is stronger than truth. We know that from Kellyanne Conway way back when. And truth is not a high value. <clears throat> but, you know, the other thing um, is that uh, is that it, it, it's um, this is cultism. And he is one of the elements of his cultism is he, he gets off on being the bad boy. And, and there are people in this country who do not apply their critical thinking, but they like bad boys. So if he does stupid, mean, indecent things, they like him for it. So you can say that he hurt himself and shot him in the foot, shot himself in the foot by reason of some of his tweets on Twitter. But at the end of the day, he was, he was being faithful to the bad boy image and the people in the base, they, were, uh, they, they liked it. They liked it, and they're going to like it again. So he's got a very wide margin of error. He could shoot somebody in Fifth Avenue and get away with it, and they would love him for being the bad boy. Hmm. All right, Chuck, to you. Um, you just heard Jay Fidel say that in, via cultism, we have bad boys in government. Um, Jay's bad boys is my wackadoodle. And speaking of wackadoodles, let's go to the primary elections that just took place in Ohio, uh, West Virginia, and Nebraska. Um, some of these candidates are, I'll use Jay's term, bad boys. Uh, they're getting elected, except for uh, that didn't happen in Nebraska. So what's going to happen to these bad boys in the general election? I mean, many times in a primary, we see extreme candidates win the, win the election and only to fail, crash, and burn in the general. What do you think is going to occur here? with these particular three states and these candidates that Donald Trump endorsed and certainly had influence on? That's a great question, Tim. I think one of the things we gotta look at is local leadership within the states and the localities, the big cities, in the areas that are gonna turn out to be swing states. Those people, rather than the Trumps and Bidens, may wind up making the most difference with the independent voters in terms of how those states come out. <clears throat> Media doesn't pay attention to that. The big money is in the high profile guys, <clears throat> Trump and his bad boys. <clears throat> but what'll be interesting to see 
over the next few months for 2022 and the next couple of years for 2024 is who emerges as the most charismatic local and regional leaders that may offer some kind of counterbalance to the Trump Act. And, you know, we had, yeah, and, go ahead. And secondly, what will DeSantis and Abbott and those guys who are trying to establish their own pre presidential bases of support off of Trump's, who, what will those guys do that may create divisions or splinters within the GOP? Let's go to that point. Um, are they going to relinquish their desires to be a presidential candidate in 2024 and let, let Donald Trump take the field? Or are they going to be watching the polls and closely monitoring whether or not Donald Trump's influence and luster has waned? Narcissists don't change. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't see any of those guys or Ted Cruz or any of the others giving up their own ambitions, aspirations, and self-interest for Trump. And you see that in people like Lindsey Graham, who out of one side of his mouth will say, yep, he incited that insurrection, all right, and on the other side, but I'm not going to vote to impeach him, and we'll punish people who do. Is, uh, is Ronald Reagan's um, old ad wise advice to fellow Republicans that thou shall not throw fellow Republicans under the bus, are those days gone? That's to you, Chuck. Oh. No, that's to you, Chuck. Well, I, I, you want me to give my, I'll give, but I want to hear Chuck, too. Yeah, that's, my, that's my to you, Chuck. My reaction to that question is um, those days are gone. Uh, all of the mm, the value, if you will, in the GOP, and it are you know defend you know uh, arguably it was of some value at some point in American history in the last you know a few decades. Uh, all that value is gone, and it's completely irresponsible, um, and it doesn't deserve to be a political party, and its leaders don't don't deserve to be leaders of the country. Um, they would rather destroy the country than provide any value. Okay, Chuck, your response to that question? It's a great question, Tim. And it kind of breaks into a couple of archetypes. Most of them, like Cruz, Geitz, DeSantis, the others, they're so self-interested. They're never going to put Trump's interests ahead of their own, and they'll always put their interests first. The lesser lights who are more dependent on Trump for their base, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, Boberts, people like that, they are going to continue to be attached to him. So that's why the whether the Democratic Party can mount leadership at local and regional levels that will be more charismatic than those two groups is going to make a big difference in 2022 and 2024. Well, let right. me add something to that, Tim. Yeah, go ahead. You know, that's that's the biggest question of all. Is the Democratic Party going to get, get its act together? Because it has not had its act together. It doesn't respond in kind. Um, it brings a spoon to a knife fight, uh, your term. Um, and, you know, bottom line is, uh, it, can, you, can you name some real leaders of the Democratic Party as a party? Can you name, I mean, I can't. Uh, the name, for example, of the chair of the DNC right now? Uh, I don't think I can. Um, there is no real high-profile leadership. There's nobody who's charismatic. And, and beyond just charisma, there is nobody who's pulling it together. Uh, you know, you talk about how it's going to go in this state or that state. How, how, it should go somewhere nationally because the GOP is going somewhere nationally. Um, they, have, you know, they have no values and they have no platform or public policy positions, but they are together. And their togetherness is based on undermining Joe Biden and our democratic government. Um, but the, you can't say that the Democrats are together. Yeah. I think it's really critical. Well, they're together and, in hiding. They're together. They make my point. Yeah, there you go. Hey, uh, Chuck, uh, before I move on to Jay, I want to ask you this. And that is, we're going to have the House Select Committee come out with their public hearings here probably in June. The report, God knows when that's coming. 
to what degree will the contents of that report or the televised, you know, the televised hearings, to what degree does that diminish Donald Trump's influence uh, in politics or certainly over the GOP? Well, the problem is, and the reason that it's not likely to diminish his influence and may actually backfire against him and enhance it, it is that it, it's divisive in the ways that he uses the most effectively by allying with the people who parrot him, who support him, who stick by him, even when they acknowledge that he's wrong and he's at fault and he's dangerous and he's destructive. Look at the media. They gave away the narrative to Trump for four years. And as they slide toward the 2022 and 2024 elections, they seem to be doing that again. Responsible, independent media is another thing that's missing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. Yeah, I, I point. echo that point absolutely. Yeah, I mean he calls he calls the uh, the, the dance, and um, you know what you what you get is oh we have to see what Trump is doing. Uh, they talk more about him than they should. Uh, they don't talk about the Democratic leadership. They don't elevate the Democratic leadership the same way. Maybe it's hard to do that. But, but, I, but I feel that the media spends altogether too much time, um, you know, uh, working the Trump story. And, and, and part of that, you know, Chuck, Tim, part of that is that he makes it that way. Remember, this is the guy that used to plant stories about himself in the New York mm -hmm. press Good when point. he was doing real estate. Uh, and, and he's doing the same thing now. Nothing has changed. He learns. He learns. Yeah, he adapts. All right, Jay. Please, for me, um, put on your Nostradamus hat and give me your best prediction of what would the first 12 months, if Donald Trump was reelected, what would that first 12 months look like? To what degree would he um, influence institutions, uh, news media? What, what would you predict? Because he does adapt. He does learn. Well, I mean, from my, my new vantage in Bogota, Colombia, uh, yes. where I will, <laughs> yes. will be living. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I, I think he'll get in there with a vengeance. And I think his base will, and his uh, acolytes will get in there with a vengeance. And they'll do all the terrible things that they've been trying to do uh, over the past few years. It will be a train wreck. It will be, may I use this as a, a noun? Um, it'll be a Ukraine. He'll be he'll be destroying things left and right. Now, <clears throat> some things, you know, it's not going to affect us. I mean, all of us, but other things will affect everyone in the country, um, like the loss of civil rights, including freedom of the press. Um, I, I, so I think in the first six months, if you ask me that, uh, I would say we're going to have a national train wreck. He's going to take. He's going to treat it as a mandate to be. Okay king and autocrat in every way. So when we had the stop the steal uh, lawsuits, you know, there's over 60 court cases. I think uh, Trump's team only won one out of 60. Yet the courts did prevail to stop what was the 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 over, you know, the, the an election stolen from Donald Trump to say he had his election stolen. Will the court still be there if Donald Trump is reelected, and he tries to do what you're suggesting. Oh, I, 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 well, I, certainly, I want to turn this over to Chuck. But um, it, it seems to me that um, the, those sixty cases um, did not really stop the base. Uh, uh, a third of the country still believes he stole that uh, Biden stole the election. A third of the country doesn't believe that Biden is a legitimate president, and a fair number of them believe that Biden is a pedophile. Of course. Because you know there's no evidence whatsoever. But if you want to be a nutcase about it, you know you you think of things like that and you do QAnon on it. Um, so I mean, truth, justice is irrelevant. Furthermore, I'm I'm not sure the federal judiciary is is as good as it was when Trump started to appoint his hundreds of judges, and they are insinuated now into the fabric of the federal judiciary, such as that judge in Florida who, without um, any medical information, any public policy considerations uh, throughout the, um, what was it, the, the mask requirement, 
on all transportation, among other things, a national order. That, that was really nutcakes. And, uh, and now we have surges. Um, so what I'm saying is that you can't count on the judiciary. And you can't count on those 60 cases anymore. And you, and you certainly can't count on a situation where a lot of people ignore the rulings of those cases. Um, they keep on trucking no matter what, trumping no matter what. And finally, those cases ultimately may have to be decided, in large possibility they'll have to be decided, at the United States Supreme Court which is a different court. And tomorrow with Avi Stoifer, we're gonna talk about how it's different today than it was. But I would say that even if you win 60 cases on some point of craziness, um, you can't count on the Supreme Court to okay. make it, make it All right. better. Chuck, for us, please put on your Nost Nostradamus hat and uh, reply to the same question. I mean, uh, Jay's prediction is, and I hate to summarize it this way, is bleak do you share that same opinion i think on our good days it'll be bleak um but the real question is where is trump and the people who are willing to do what he wants them to do going to concentrate their focus certainly immigration is likely to be one and the southern border has always been a focal one for trump that's worked very well with his base I can't imagine him not going back there. Hey, and I distinguish a little bit between the learning that Jay talks about and strategic learning that has any national or long-term benefit. He doesn't care. He's almost 80. The last thing in his mind is what it's going to be like 10 years from now, <laughs> except to have his image instilled to the extent possible. So immigration is an area. Jay, Tim, what do you think will be the other focal areas for him and his minions? Elevating his family. Don't forget, at the end of 10 years, he may be older, but his family's not old. He'll try to get him in office. He's yeah, the legacy dynasty. factor. That's, the, that's important for a, a narcissist is the legacy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, mean, I, I, think, I think it's going to be actually beyond our comprehension because we're all law-abiding, rule-of-law people. And I don't think we can actually imagine the kinds of things that he would do. <clears throat> it goes way beyond the kinds of things he tried to do. I mean, I mean for example, I, 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 I see great risk for the average citizen in terms of civil rights, uh, search and seizure, First Amendment, all those, um, uh, all those degradations that took place in the 30s in Germany. Um, that's where he's going. And if there's, no, if there's no guardrails, nobody to stop him in the federal courts or um, you know, in the agencies around him. You know, the Mark Esper book is particularly scary because Mark Esper, although he, he came out a little late, uh, I understand that, but he came out a little late. Um, fact is that uh, he stopped Trump from doing some bad stuff. And next time, Trump isn't going to have a Mark Esper on his, on his staff. Yeah. Next time he's going to have a complete acolyte over there, and and if the guy isn't an acolyte, he'll be fired instantly, and he'll bring in some moron person uh, who is neither qualified nor has a backbone, and and the result is Trump will do whatever Trump wants. It'll be a a beacon to the world that autocracy works, um, and and that's what will happen. I, I, to go to your earlier question, almost immediately, mm -hmm. you'll see it as a mandate. And I agree with Chuck, you know, immigration is one thing, but you can name three or four other things. Yeah. You know, they'll be they'll never be gun control. Um, voting voting rights will be further diminished. Uh, the right of the people, the, the social safety net, um, you know, all those social programs are out the window. Uh, and, and, and he doesn't care. As you said, he doesn't care if people like him. He's in power. He will. He will not have to cotton to the base anymore. Yeah. To be president I, to, again, do whatever he wants. I, I think that we're, we're missing the big one then, and as all dictators know that if they're going to be successful of the, um, the rate, rise to power of an autocracy, they've got to attack the media. They've got to stop journalism in its tracks as best as possible. So you can expect to see some kind of intervention. 
uh, his influence on the FCC and, and, and further erosion of journalism and the reporting of, of, of Trump administration um, behavior. Uh, um, okay, so Chuck, what strategies might the Democrats, I mean, once they get out of hiding, if that ever happens, what kind of effective strategies could they employ uh, to, to blunt the wave of popularity for Donald Trump? What, what, what strategies, um, avenues can they say, hey, this, we got to stop this? The last successful strategy for the Democratic Party has to look back toward Obama time. And that was one of the best grassroots coalition campaigns that we have seen in our history. If they don't do that, they're going to be looking at really bleak results. Whether they can do it, how they can do it, they're going to need really, really good local regional leaders with charisma, courage, and conscience, those three elements. All right, good answer. Uh, does a candidate who sees Donald Trump as the heir apparent, does a GOP candidate or even a Democrat or independent candidate for president uh, in 2024, do they try to um, use the tactic of the 14th Amendment, paragraph three, basically saying if you were involved with any kind of sedition activity that you are not qualified for office, does, does someone try to pull that to, start, to try to stop Donald Trump? Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's this is for Chuck first. Uh, oh, Chuck, sorry. Let's see if he agrees with me. <laughs> it it may be worth a shot if they can bring it. For example, in D.C., where they have a very courageous federal district court judge who has stood up to Trump consistently and to Trump's DOJ during that period. So, where they do it, how they do it, who does it, will be critical. And at what point do they have to um, enter into the fray of that? When when would they have to uh, suggest a suit? Chuck? Well, we've already seen the unsuccessful result with Marjorie Taylor Greene. <clears throat> they have to learn from that. Mm -hmm. Timing and strategy are going to be critical for them. <clears throat> they will need to build a grassroots base of support for that, as well as the legal support. They can't just win it by winning one or two cases at the lower federal court levels. All righty. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Have at it. The same question. Well, you know, timing, it's all about timing, I think. And if you go too early, you got a, a problem with standing. Uh, if, you're, if you're already uh, um, an opponent in an election with Trump, you definitely have standing. And so uh, that's kind of a little late to get this you know, this show on the road, but uh, I don't think you'd have the standing problem then. Uh, mostly it's about timing. If you come in late, then it's going to go wending its way through the, uh, the federal courts and uh, get to the Supreme Court, which I wouldn't count on. Um, and then they're not going to change very much between now and then. And so I would have no, no confidence, I'm sorry, uh, with this Supreme Court um, enforcement. So would now be the time? Well, if you, can, if you can find a way to get into court, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I tell you the truth, and, and you can quote me on this. Both of you guys can quote me on this. Uh, the 14th Amendment, Section 3, is written in English. It says in English, you can't run if you've been involved in an uh, in, in insurrection. It says that. And there is no question whatsoever in the English language that this applies to Trump and his friends. Yeah. And, and uh, on the other hand, some federal judges don't read English very well these days, mostly the, the Trump appointees. So I, I think, you know, as, as Chuck says, it's, it's worth a shot to try it out. But, you know, it's got to be in the right district or circuit, and it's got to be um, with the right, the right plaintiff. Well, maybe a candidate with standing takes the House Select Committee report and plops it on a desk of a court and say, there's my brief. It's all right there. We'll see. That's all a witch hunt. You know that. Yeah, exactly. OK, you know, we're out of time. So I want to go and ask uh, Chuck for your last thoughts about this topic or any other topic you might have in mind. I think in a nutshell, it has to come from the people. It has to come from 
charisma, courage, and conscience at their leadership level more than at the national level and reinforce the national okay. uh, I know this last comment, but here's my last question. Do you see anyone in the Democratic Party that has the, the charisma, the luster? Um, I was thinking of Governor Newsom, but uh, do you see anyone out there? I, I don't. I see people who have some of the elements, Cory Booker, Pete Buttigieg, others, but we really need a lot more Stacey Abrams out there. Great. Jay, your last thoughts. Yeah, Stacey Abrams. I've heard that from so many people. It's, it's, a, it's a rising chorus for Stacey Abrams. You know, my, my, um, my, my, my takeaway on this, Tim and, and uh, Chuck, is this. <clears throat> this is a civil war. Um, and uh, the Democratic Party has got to see it as a national experience, not necessarily a local one. It's got to start with leadership nationally. And the Democratic Party not doing that. <clears throat> You know, I get email every day by the hundreds from various races and organizations around the country. And most of them, I don't know who they are. And I am not going to send them money. I'm not going to click on their checkbox for $5 or 10 I don't know who they are. Um, if there were a national uh, DNC, if there was somebody I could identify with who said, look, why don't you give money to this candidate in this state? Why don't you give money to this organization in this place following these, you know, these principles? That would be very convincing to me. And I would, I would act on that. Right now, the fragmentation is deafening. Uh, and, and unless the Democratic Party does that and, and talks to me, talks to me about all these fragmented pieces and gives me some guidance, I'm not going to get together with the others. This is a national experience. People are giving money across state lines. Local elections become national elections. Local fights become national fights. Somebody has got to lead the national fight. And that's not happening. All right. So it's more than just the economy. All right, Jay, Chuck, I want to thank you both. Jay Fidel, Chuck Crumpton for joining us on our recent edition of American Issues Take One. Uh, please join us next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. And I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Until then, aloha. Uh, uh. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.